Bam of knives. Go bam, bam. Moses may in the knives. This is in parens. Moses has been Naaman, known in rabbinical literature, literature as Rambam, from the acronym Rabbi Moses Ben Naaman, from 1135 to 1204, a rabbinic authority, codifier, philosopher, and royal physician. The most illustrious figure in Judaism in the post Talmudic era, regarded by many of the greatest Jewish as the greatest Jewish philosopher of the Middle Ages, and one of the greatest of all time. He was successful in bringing four cultures Greco Roman, Arab, Jewish, and Western together in one person and in doing so remains one of the most influential religious philosophers of the intellectual world. His teaching influences other faiths as well as Jews. However, it is his commentary on Jewish texts that mark him out as one of the most influential and important Jews in history. He wrote three major essays on Jewish law, the most famous being The Guide for the Perplexed. And each of them is still regarded as hugely important in Jewish philosophy. This monumental work laid the foundation for all subsequent Jewish philosophic inquiry known as Shekera and stimulated centuries of philosophical Jewish writing. His large 14 volumes work, Mishnah Torah, to date holds canonical authority in regard to the codification of Talmudic law. That was from the Jewish Virtual Library on the internet, um, the famous people and the BBC. Rambam says in chapter 12, Paragraph 2 of the Laws Concerning King Moshe. Our sages taught there will be no difference between the current age and the era of Moshe, except, <clears throat> except our emancipation from subjugation to the Gentile kingdoms. The simple meaning of the words of the prophets appears to imply that the war of Gog and Magog will take place at the beginning of the Messianic Age. Before the war of Gog and Magog, a prophet will arise to rectify Israel's conduct and prepare their hearts for the redemption, as it is written. Before I go any further, there will be no war of Gog and Magog. Period. I am Moshe. This is the Moshe, Moshe the era of Moshe. And uh, uh, in addition, I'm not here to rectify Israel's conduct. And I, I would like to think I'm preparing their hearts for the redemption because it is here. This is from Malachi chapter 3, verse 23. Behold, I am sitting in you. Uh, Eliyahu, which is uh, Elijah, before the advent of the great and awesome day of God, he will not come in order to declare the pure impure, nor to declare the impure pure, nor will he come in order to disqualify the lineage of those presumed to be of flawless descent, nor to validate lineage which is presumed to be blemished. And I agree. <laughs> Rather, he will come in order to establish peace in the world. As the above prophecy continues, Malachi 3, verse 24, he will bring back the hearts of the fathers to the children. And that is incorrect. I don't come here to bring peace or have the world come to peace 
or to establish peace in the world. No one can do that. Humanity will never be at peace. It's just not what man is. It's not how things have ever worked. Elijah does not come to establish peace in the world. And again, God dictated this to me. I didn't come up with all this on my own. From the book Isaiah 53, In the Day of the Lord. Elijah does not come to establish peace in the world, but to make the many righteous by his knowledge in reconciling the sons to the Father and the fathers to the sons of the, the family, family members, one to another, of the Jewish people by having them be mindful of the teachings God gave Moses at Oro and to the practice of Judaism. Okay, be mindful. That's an amendment to the first, uh, the, the, the covenant between God and the Israelites given by Moses. It's just an amendment because they had to have strict compliance was 100% of the Israelites agreeing to it, that they would all abide by it. Today he's saying be mindful, and he's also saying it doesn't have to be 100% of the people, those who heed and revere and esteem his name. And he knows it's not going to be all of the Jews, notwithstanding the fact he has forgiven their sins and remembers their iniquities no more and to be a messenger of the new covenant with sin forgiveness. That's why it's new. There's an amendment to it, and in addition to it, it's sin forgiveness. That's the only difference. I will be your God, and you will be my people. That's the covenant. And it's never changed. It's never gone away. It's new. Only in the sense that there's been an amendment to it, and an addition to it, and it's a ratification and confirmation of the covenant at Mount Sinai, or Rambam and the sages say in chapter 12, paragraph 3 of the laws concerning King Moshe, God makes it real clear. He, call, he calls Moshe, my servant David, a shepherd. He's a teacher. There's been no divinic kingdom, dynasty, that Rambam thinks is coming. This, and that's all you have. Now, there is a, a slight reference to king and prince throughout the uh, covenant of friendship. Those, it just means leader in, in this context. He's a ruler amongst the people, not a ruler over the people. This is just Rambam's rendition of what a divinic kingdom would be. But it's not in the Hebrew Bible. During the era of the King Moshe, once his kingdom has been established and all of Israel has gathered around him, the entire nation's line of descent will be established on the basis of his words through the prophetic spirit which will rest upon him. In the Middle Ages and in antiquity, they believed in prophetic spirits. This will not happen. I do not have a prophetic spirit. The spirit of God alighted upon me that he's a person that he helps me. He'll tell me things uh, and teach me things. But uh, there's no such... No, no, there's, by and large, nobody believes in that kind of thing anymore. If somebody can just prophesy. God prophesied. He has absolute knowledge of humanity from Adam on to the ends of the earth. Okay, now he can tell a man, write this down, or go tell the people this. But this is coming from him by knowledge. No man gets a spirit upon him and all of a sudden he can prophesy. So, no, the entire, the entire nation's line of descent is, is not going to be established by anybody, including not myself, who I, and I am Moshe, or God himself. So that's just not going to happen. 
as it is written, He shall sit as a refiner and purifier. He will purify the lineage of the Levites first, stating that this one is a priest of defined lineage, and this one is the Levite of divine lineage. Ram Bam basis for this belief is a verse in the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 2, verse 63. The governor said to them, They shall not eat of the most holy things until a priest arises who will wear the yom and the tenet. From this verse, one can infer that the genealogy of those presumed to be of unquestioned priestly and Levitical lineage will be traced by means of the prophetic spirit, and those found to be of such lineage will be made known. He will define the lineage of the Israelites according to their tribe alone, i.e., he will make known each person's tribal origin, stating that this one is from this tribe and this is from another tribe. It's not going to happen. And he's, talk, he's talking about Moshiach being the purifier. He got that wrong too. He shall sit as the refiner and purifier from the first paragraph, chapter 12. Paragraph 3 is not Moshiach. God purifies and refines. And he comes with Elijah and the angel of the covenant that you desire. Ramban says the prophetic spirit will rest upon the anointed one. The prophecy of the Hebrew Bible, the prophecies of God. I, I just gave you my summarization of, of, of before I read this, of, of, of what I'm about to reread. The difference is, this sounds better, and this is what God dictated. The prophecy of the Hebrew Bible, the prophecies of God. David does not have a prophetic spirit. While prophetic spirits were a common belief in the ancient age and Middle Ages, that is not true for the age of reasoning and information. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 defines the attributes of the spirit that alights upon the anointed one as a spirit of wisdom and insight, a spirit of counsel and valor. A spirit of devotion and reverence for the Lord. There is nothing regarding a prophetic spirit, and even that, it's just, it's just what they, uh, what the spirit of God lit upon me, and He has all these attributes, and they teach me, and they tell me as I speak to people how to do and how to be. But a spirit didn't just align upon me in and of itself, and within God's spirit is God Himself, His very presence, His mind. You know, it's a hard concept because Judaism's never taught it, but it's in Ezekiel. I, I don't recall the chapter and verse, but God told Ezekiel, uh, get up upon your feet. Ezekiel says, at that very moment, a spirit entered into me, and I could hear God's words. Couldn't hear God's words until the spirit entered into him. Why? They had to be inside you. They had to be inside you. It's speaking to your mind. God doesn't have a mouth or tongue. You know, he, he can, within me, he can make me sense, perceive that this is where his presence is. And that is where the words are coming from. As though to my ear, even though it doesn't really seem like my ear, but it does seem like it's coming from over here or over here, wherever he wants to do it. Spirit enters into you, and God is in His Spirit. And this is Malachi chapter 3, verse 20, uh, 2 through 5. But who can endure the day of His coming? And who can hold out when He appears? For He is like a smelter's fire and like fuller's lie. He shall act like a smelter and perjure of silver. And he shall purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. So they shall present offerings in righteousness. 
Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of yore, and in the years of old. But first, I will step forward to contend against you, and I will act as a relentless accuser against those who have no fear of me. This is God, and not David or Elijah. It's God. And what does he say? I will act as a relentless accuser. He says when, <laughs> when but in most of you, his servant David is here. He says, I'm going to have a reckoning and dismiss the shepherds of the flock, the rabbis. I'm going to have a reckoning and not dismiss them. Primarily for teaching this Messianic there. Second, secondly, for ignoring his prophet. That would be me. Shun, despised, and held of no account. That's how they've been treating me for years now. God's been with me 13 years to prepare me for this, and that's how they treated me. In Hebrew writing, it is common to express the same idea twice. Okay, God, God's telling me to move on. I don't need to hear that. He just had to do with smelting and this and that. In Malachi 1 and 2, the priesthood has been defiled. They offered polluted offerings. They had turned from God and refused to listen to him, and they profaned God's covenant. They disregard God's ways. This is in quotes from Ezekiel chapter. Well, it's in quotes anyway. Those who have no fear of me would be the priestly tribe of the Levites and not pertain to genealogy or tribal lineage, lineage, but to Ezekiel 34. Thus said the Lord God, I'm going to deal with the shepherds. I will demand a reckoning of them for my flock, and I will dismiss them from tending my flock. It's Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 10. Then I will appoint a single shepherd over them to tend them, my servant David. Again, that's Moshe. He shall tend them. He shall be a shepherd to them. Not a king. I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David shall be a ruler among them. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will grant them a covenant of friendship. Malachi chapter 3, verse 3 says that, he shall purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold or silver, <clears throat> so that they shall present offerings in righteousness. This would be those rabbis who accept the words of the prophets of God as interpreted in this day of reasoning and information, and not as interpreted in the ancient age and middle age. You want to be purified. If you want to get out from under the dismissal, you're going to have to learn everything God dictated to me in Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord and the second book, The Life of God's Righteous Servant of Isaiah 53, which is my life. That'll purify you. That'll get you back on the scroll of remembrance so you can see the heaven God is creating. The name Israel still so ain't do. <clears throat> the era of redemption, restoration, and exaltation versus the day of the Lord as found in the book. Randam and the sages interpreted it as a prophecy that Moshiach, with a prophetic spirit, will determine the lineage of the priests and Levites from a verse in the book of Israel. I've covered this. Anyway, the governor said to them, They shall not eat of the most holy things until a priest arrives who will wear the Urim and Turim. This has nothing to do with genealogy of Levites today, or purification and refining, or a prophetic spirit on Moshe. This is not a prophecy of a high priest arising. And it is not Moshe but an answer to those that could not prove they were Levites. 
when the verse is put into its proper context. This is Ezra, chapter 2, verses 61 through 63. Of the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Hakuz, the sons of Barsilie, who had married a daughter of Barsilie, and had taken his name. These searched for their gene genealogical records, but they could not be found. So they were disqualified for the priesthood. The Teshatta ordered them not to eat of the most holy things until a priest with, uh, until a priest with urine and feminine should appear. It was just a specific instance. In the Hebrew Bible, the Urim and Thummim are elements of the breastplate worn by the high priest attached to the Ephite. They are connected with divination in general and clerimancy in particular, a belief in antiquity in the Middle Ages rarely believed in today. Two objects used by the high priest to answer a question or reveal the will of God. The apod was made of fine linen and consisted of two pieces which hung from the neck and covered both the back and front, above the tunic and outer garment. Clerimancy is a form of sortition, a casting of lots. A casting of lots in which an outcome is determined by means that normally would be considered random, such as the rolling of dice that are sometimes believed to reveal the will of God. Testing of lots, the will of God. <laughs> this is not believed in today. Ezra is not a book of the prophets. Teshatha was not a prophet and did not speak the words of God. Few people believe in divination and clarimancy today. Matters and things of the Hebrew Bible written for an era gone by. In some nation, as great as this man was, and we're talking about the year 1200 or so when he died, born in the 1100s, uh, he was an incredible man. There's no doubt about it. But he didn't have the science, the medicine, the knowledge, the information, the ability to get information that we have today. It's a different time. We just don't believe in some of these things they believed in. You can't just say or say, just say. Now he, you know, ran that mouth, so I can't believe it's not in here. <laughs> he, he said, he said, no, she is going to perfect the world, and the entire world is going to speak Hebrew. Okay? And he gets that from Zebaniah, chapter 9, verse 10. God says, and I think most people have heard this phrase, they shall be a people of a pure speech. He takes that to be the people of the world. Well, the only problem is that, read verse 9. In verse 9, God talks about his anger against the world, and how he, this, he was actually terminated with fire. He's not, he's, he's not talking about them. He's just talking about his people. The peoples of the Jewish people. And guess what? Today they are a people of pure speech in, the, in, in Israel. See, the, the, the only time an ancient language has been revived in the modern times, and that's Hebrew. That's, for the, that's their official language, uh, along with uh, Arabic in Israel. So it was a true, it was a true uh, prophecy of God. They should be a people of pure speech, but he's only talking about the Jewish people. When he says the people, he's talking about his people. You know, if he's talking about the people of the world, you know what he's going to say? The people of the world. His people. The Jews. Okay, well that's all I have on, on land day. Again, I'm surprised I don't have that. Thank you very much for listening.